Hello, everyone. Um, good to see so many of you here. So we've been working on this resource assessment data model for well over a year. And one of the things that has come up frequently is, is that people have expressed, you know, sort of not understanding what exactly is a data model and how to get started with it. And so today's presentation is just a very high level introduction for why we've built this, what it is, and how you can get started with it. So the whole presentation I'm about to give is actually available at a blog. And for those who would love to read and prefer to read rather than to hear someone go on, um, you can read everything here. So the first thing I will do is not just the blog, the whole work is available as a GitHub repo. I've just recently switched my tab to it, and I'll be doing this frequently through the presentation um, just so that you have the context of where things are. So the blog, if you go to this page and switch to the discussions tab, and I'll open that in a new tab here and go down, there's a number of discussions and you'll see this blog is hosted as a discussion here. And I'll open that in a new page and this is it. So if you do prefer, you know, want to go back, get a more detailed understanding, I'd love to read through it, I'd recommend you go here. Um, while we're at it, I'll make a quick shout out to the recently um, written uh, version of this sort of a follow up to the uh, data model that describes the portion that's specifically to the calibration certificates. Um, and I, I really highly recommend it. Heiko, who's worked with calibrations for a lot, contributed a lot to it, you know, has written a really good post here. So back to my presentation here. So the first question is why we're working on this digital data model. Um, everyone here pretty familiar with data coming out of a measurement campaign for wind resource data, but let's group them, you know, maybe into sensor measurements on the left and then all the metadata on the right. So um, I'm sure each of these will look very familiar to all of you. Um, the, the little screenshot on the right is from a sample um, PDF form. It's not comprehensive. I'm just taking a small um, screenshot of it, but you know it's a pretty critical piece of information where the measurement was made or who installed it, uh, loggers, what time zones the, the measurements were made at, you know, and all the different details about sensors, so that their height, their type, what kind of sensor. So all of this is pretty critical to give you know context to the actual numbers coming out of the sensors. Um, and often, you know, wind resource data assessment, um, you know, it almost feels like most of the work sometimes is just understanding the history of the mast. You know, if things changed, when did they change? So, um, and that's where a lot of the manual work seems to go, in addition to doing some cleaning work. Um, and so the wind resource data model, at least primarily currently, is focused on organizing this piece of information, the metadata, uh, which is the context behind all the mast. So, um, and while I'm at it, I'll give you a little warning. It is, kids are getting ready to go to school. So if you hear some background noise, <laughs> that's what it is. Um, so let's, let me just discuss this PDF form uh, screenshot here just for a second. And if we just think about its pros and cons, you know, really the best thing, you know, what it was designed for is its readability. It's very easy to read and understand. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to build an automated system or use this in an analysis, the first thing you'll have to do is digitize this information, right? And often that means manual data entry. You take this information, you put it into whatever software you're using it next. That means there's chances of error. Um, if we just look at, and it's probably hard for some of you to read, but you know, there's some logger slope information here. You know, it's 0 0.0457. And if that was entered as 0.47 and you left out a five, you know, that that's a meaningful impact on your resource assessment. Now, not saying that error happens all the time, but you know, once you're doing data entry, you need a certain amount of time and effort and cognitive work to check what was entered is correct. Um, and then 
you know, it, since data entry is part of the work, you know, everyone has to do it. The, the people who installed it, the developer, the team who, that you know, has been maintaining it, then any consultant that gets it. So it's it's a work that's repeated through every organization. Um, third, if you're trying to build a QAQC system that is not manual, or at least tries to do some of it in an automated way, you know, if the first step is to manual do a manual data entry, it makes it harder to automate. And then finally, everyone has had to work with, you know, a slightly different variation of this form, or you've had to reinvent it internally. Uh, maybe you've done that yourself. Um, and what that means is it's harder to build a standardized format um, that's that can be easily exchanged. Um, you know, for example, let's say you're trying to build a, a tool that, you know, checks if the logger slope and calibration slope is the same, but the form that the data comes in maybe uses a slightly different name for all of this. And so maybe it's logger slope or a slope and logger. So that makes it difficult to build an automated system. And so that's where the wind resource data model goals are, is number one, make it easier, you know, make the data exchange easier for digitization and automated processing. And here the subtle difference is, you know, a PDF or a Word document, these are like digital versions of a form, but they're not really digitization friendly in the sense that, you know, if you need data out of a Word document or a PDF, you need to write some sort of a specialized tool to extract that data. And I'll show you later on what a more digitization friendly format is. And then the second thing is to enable, you know, this easier digitization, um, what we, what the model does is provide, you know, standard naming convention and a structure to organize your metadata. So let's just quickly start with what is a digitization friendly format. Um, here's a PDF form, the same one we've been looking at, and let's focus for now on a small section, the sensor related information. So I'll, I'll put it over here on the left, and then let's look at what this information looks like in a JSON format. So on the left, you can see the sensor channel, sensor type, or you know who built it, uh, serial orientation, etc. And the same information here is in you know, a JSON format. So if you've worked with JSON, this will look very familiar. Um, for those who are not familiar with the JSON format, it's the, the default standard, I would say, for how data moves around on the internet when you're getting data from the server to the to a browser, um, for example. Um, and the difference here is, you know, the PDF form is clearly easy to read. But when it comes to parsing data for a program, you know, it's much, much easier to work in a JSON format. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, if you're getting data out of a PDF form, you will have to do something, you know, either man manual data entry or a specialized tool. But to read this data into, let's say, a Python or in our program is maybe one or two lines of code. Did I hear a question? Okay. Uh, if you have questions, you know, feel free to interrupt me, but I'll, I think we should have enough time at the end. So um, the JSON or uh, formats like it, uh, YAML being another one, is what we what the data model recommends as the way of uh, interchanging data. The second is the question about a reporting standard. So, you know, let's go back to this example where we have PDF on the left and JSON on the right. You know, there's still some questions, you know, we're trying to describe a sensor measurement campaign here, and it has a lot of useful pieces of information like, okay, the sensor was at channel one, it's an anima meter, you know, it's at this height, this orientation. But is is that all you need? Like, should there be more? Um, you know, it's not clear, right? Should the boom information be part of this or should it be listed separately? Um, you know, there's so there is sort of a slightly lack of clarity or standardization on what is a minimum reporting standard. Um, to describe a sensor or a tower. Um, second is naming convention. You know, I alluded to this earlier. Um, you know, maybe some forms call it logger slope, some call it slope in logger, or maybe programmed slope. Um, you know, again, these variations are not a big deal if, if it's just meant for manual uh, 
observation or manual data entry, but if you're building an automated tool, you know, all of these just make it that much harder. And finally, the data structure. Um, Right now, if you're looking at it, it looks like wow, this you know this table is simple. We we've gotten most of the critical piece of information here, but um, you know I think the resource assessment data can get you know surprisingly complex, and especially the longer it's been on the field. Um, maybe you know maybe they put the logger slope in incorrectly and came changed it a week later. You know, so you need a model that can capture that variation or. Perhaps there was a data entry mistake somewhere that that was fixed. The time zone was changed, or maybe the height got bumped from 80.1 to 79.8 during you know uh, nmometer replacement. You know, uh, same with orientation. So different things can change, um, and how can you capture that uh, in a data? If you're going to exchange data digitally, you know the model has to be um, flexible enough to capture all these variations. So. That's where the wind resource data model comes in. Is the first thing it does is it puts out a, a standard and a structure for how to think about data, data digitally. Here's a little bit of a screenshot on the right. It might be hard to read, and that's okay. Um, and you know, and here is sort of a sort of very high level um, screenshot of how the data model recommends you you organize your information. There could be, you know, on top is a plant or a project. A plant or a project could have remote sensing or mast um, on site. And once you start with mast, there's mass geometry associated with it, which is, is it lattice or tubular? You know, if it's lattice, what are the different frame information? And, you know, and similarly, there is a logger on a mast. And the logger makes measurements, and a measurement has you know different logger settings associated with it. There's details about the sensor that made the measurement, how it was mounted. So there are all these pieces of information. And let me go in and show you where this information is. Um, and and let's maybe pick out let's for example logger and see what information it gives you regarding that. Stephen, who's following up on this, uh, will have a much more detailed example. Uh, but let me go switch to the resource assessment here. So if you go down to the documentation part, I will open the schema documentation in a new tab. And here is all the entities that are related to a resource assessment. And what I will do is, you know, there's column names and how do you describe LIDAR or logger, but let's go to the logger section just as an example. And here is one of the outputs of this data model is, let's say if you're building a program or a form to really capture everything about a logger in detail, you know, here's what we recommend. You track OEM, you track, you know, models, serial numbers. Um, you know, firmware versions and on and on how long it was in the field um, and lots of other information that I'm sure you've, you know, seen in different capacities. So if you're building the next forum, you know, please consider like looking at this, uh, you know, as a, as a resource. So back to here. Um, so that's the first output of this data model is it describes all the different entities that go in here and how you can describe each of the entity further. The second thing the data model gives you is a sample document. So um, I showed you a PDF version before and, and a small uh, sample of what that looks like in a JSON format, but we actually have a whole um, example here. If you go to demo data, if you go to IRA JSON, you know, Stephen from Rightwind, he's put together a really complete comprehensive example of, hey, if you have a mast, here's an example of how that mast can be represented digitally. And this, in fact, is the top, it will be, you know, in one of the coming uh, or even the next presentation. So this is one of the outputs. Um, and then there are more tools. We have more Jupyter notebooks that show you how you can process data that that's come in when resource data model. And for those who feel comfortable working with databases, we actually have a Postgres um, SQL script that can help create a Postgres database. And you can actually make a database here, you know, within one hour that's up and running uh, that can support the wind resource assessment data model. And both of these 
I'll go back to um, the GitHub page. If you go to the tools section, here is, you know, the Python notebook is here and the SQL script is here too in the tools section. Yep. And I've shown you a few things where are where they are in the GitHub page, but you know, feel free to like go through it and you'll find, you know, there's some piece of information that, that you'll find useful. Um, so moving on, um, since the whole project is hosted on GitHub, it's completely open access, and not only is the data model open access, but all the meeting notes, discussion, it's completely open. You know, so often if there is a question about Hey, why is the calibration this way, or why are the these are the height decisions? Um, you'll probably find a GitHub issue that maybe you know, if you go to this issue section here, you'll probably find discussion on why you know why that issue was raised, you know how we talked about it, and how the decision was made. So it's completely open. Um, it, the license is commercial friendly, so it's a BSD three. You can use it for commercial work. Um, We've had, you know, it's not a project developed, you know, in isolation. We've had broad uh, industry participation, and you know, developers, OEM consultants. Um, just the active committee actually has, I think, 40 plus years in, in research assessment. And the one thing I want you to take away is we enthusiastically welcome all participation. So, and there's many ways to do it. You can open a GitHub issue. Um, if there, if you see something that's missing, why isn't that? piece of information in the data model you, know, you can post it on a Slack channel, but the best place is you can open a GitHub issue. You can join our Slack channel where we exchange information or you can ask questions. Um, and then finally, consider joining our weekly meetings. We do it almost every week, uh, though that might change in the future. Um, we're always there in person. So. Um, how can you use it? Um, I'll present three use cases from the simplest to maybe the more advanced versions. The first thing is if you're working on another tool or another, the next um, data format for whatever you're building, you now I would say consider at least, if you're not adopting the whole data model, at least consider using the same naming convention. Um, so, you know, and maybe at least the benefit will be that you'll be slowly starting to work towards one you know, generally standard naming convention for the industry. So that's the simplest way to get started. The second one is if you're exchanging service forums or other sort of resource assessment data between, you know, consultant or other installer, you know, consider sending in, you know, a JSON version of this data model together with your PDF. It actually, we have, you know, we have a sample document. We have examples of Python scripts. You know, database scripts for how you can build um, a data model that can go with your PDF. So it's it really is probably no more than like a day's effort away. So you know that's one thing for you to consider. It is is as an addendum to your current data forms, and it'll make it so that every party who gets it downstream, you know, gets a model that they can you know start processing without manual data entry. And the final version is that you could use the data model, uh, you know, to architect an internal database. You know, we have a script that helps you get going very quickly, and there's all this documentation. If you're building or looking to revise your internal database, you know, I would recommend you at least take a look at it. Um, you know, towards the end, our want to share a little bit of our internal experience using this uh, work. Um, we have been or I have been contributing to the project for 12 plus months and internally we work on building data platform for resource assessment to capture data coming from mass, solar, uh, med towers, etc. And one thing I can say at this point is that it saved us months of development time. Um, but just as importantly, is it's one thing very confident is that it's better than anything we would have developed independently working you know, just by ourselves internally. So, um, you know, really happy to been part of this project and also, you know, we've definitely seen the benefit of um, having this sort of 
common data standard and and also getting the collective experience of other folks you know who've worked on this field for so long um you know all this time saved means you know we've been able to focus on some really fun visualizations so just think if you get as soon as you get a data and if it comes in a, a json that's compliant with data model we can immediately render that data to see what you know what the the, the schematic layout of these masts or or remote sensing data is and you know even get a sense of like how long they've been on the field and how long they overlap immediately and um and i think it it will help you know it's helped us with um being efficient in terms of going from all that raw data to having like a visualization that explains to you you know what's happened here uh, in terms of the campaign history solution um if you are working you know, to build the next tool or you're sending data, you have an opportunity to send data to someone else on a new context. You know, please consider using the wind resource assessment data model. Um, chances are it will save you considerable time and even add to the quality of your work. And if you do adopt it, you know, you will help grow and support, you know, this open standard that uh that i think is much needed so that's pretty much my presentation um if there are questions i'm happy to answer any um i will i'm just taking a look at the comments here but feel free to unmute yourself and and ask questions if you'd like Uh, Amit, Mike here. So we do have a, a question which is really about longer term roadmap. We do have a roadmap uh, section later on, so we will try to address it there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do, as you just said, Amit, I encourage folks to please uh, raise those questions again at, at that point. Um, but if you do have some questions about what Amit just presented uh, and understanding it or, or where to find things, uh, please do ask us now. Thanks. And I see that there's a question from Anna Maria regarding does the data model have long term data corrections? Um, you know, I assume that's a question related to the MCP stage of your analysis. The data model right now is really focused on the data coming out of your measurement campaign and, and really that, you know, everything, all the data you need to get to the starting line of your wind resource assessment. The MCP being a little bit further down the road is not part of the, the resource assessment data model, but we are having discussions on what are the next things we should support. So that could certainly be part of the road. Yeah, and I, I just want to point out that at some point there's a there's a break point between the data model functionality and what would be considered, you know, analysis and I, I do think, you know, to uh, to Andrew's point about including things like, you know, complex flow correction information, which is somewhere in that gray space between, you know, measurement information and a, you know, a post processing uh, kind of feature, you know, how do we treat those things? So I think as we evolve, we'll continue to incorporate those kinds of things. Uh, but as a general theme, I think reproducibility and traceability are really important and they will kind of play into, you know, workflows and that kind of stuff. But this data model is a foundation of that. Mm -hmm. um, I see a question from Andrew. Black. Oh, no, I think Andrew, you're responding to an answer uh, question previously. Um, there's a, sorry, mm -hmm. Mish, the, there's a question there about sensor history. I can. Uh -huh take that sure go into the deep dive of the json model okay so hang on it's coming <laughs> yeah hang on the short of it is that the data model will just you know by design will help you handle these changes and i think Stephen will show you an example um i see a question from edward we've been playing with the db very helpful uh, good to know we don't know who's playing with it so i'm glad you said something um are there any tools or SQL to go from the DB to generate a JSON? Um, 
we don't have anything hosted internally, but um, there, there are a lot of open source tools that can take your database and export it into a, something like JSON, or you could probably write a script to do it. And maybe if you do, maybe you'll consider sharing it back. Yeah, th this is Ed. Can you guys hear me? Uh. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we see on your page there was already some JSON created. I don't know if that JSON in the demo, data demo, was was created through anything or obviously I understand <clears throat> understanding the data model. You, there's, it could be quite complicated, the SQL statements to write to, to generate that JSON. I don't know if that JSON was just hand edited for an example or if that was. Yeah. I, I. I created that JSON uh, from our own internal tools because um, the our database is pretty much exactly the same as this data model database, apart from a few changes. So I was able to produce that from our own tools. Um, okay. I will be showing you a form, a web app form that you can use to fill out the data model as well. Okay. All right. Thanks. This is great. Okan, I sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, I see a question on any feedback from proprietary analysis software companies. Um, do you want to come in and ask that question? On, like, do you mean software like OpenWind or? Open yeah, exactly. Open wind, um, wind farmer analyst, which is now also going the way where you have uh, a lot of scripting functionality mm -hmm. um, and tries to have a streamlined uh, process throughout the wind farm, uh, wind analysis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just curious I can, about that. I can I can take that. Um, so we received. I well, first I should say Tom Lambert is on the line. I think Tobias uh, is on the line from. EMD. I think we've received uh, guidance from both EMD and Windographer that they're looking that you know integrating the data model is on their roadmap. Um, but Tobias or or Tom, would you like to uh, elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, quickly quickly say hello. Hello, I'm Tobias from EMD. We make Windfo. Uh, I don't think anyone really knows EMD as a company. Um, uh, yeah, we have it on on our roadmap. Uh, it was just that in I'm that that's why I'm here to just follow up and see how um, how far things are along because uh, there's a lot of other things also that happen. And I think um, we wanted to start implementing once it looks like it's uh, relatively final, and I think it looks like it's relatively final. So I will take this meeting as a good starting point towards transmitting that back into my organization to maybe getting started with this relatively soon. Great, thank you. And oh, kind of like I think there is another presentation from Gibson later on today. Who you know, he'll talk more about mm -hmm. not just software, but other you know, people too who are considering using it or are in the process of. Uh, thank you. Hi, this is this is Tom Lambert. I, I work with um, UL on the Windographer software, and yeah, same as um, same thing with us. We're very happy to see a standard like this, and we are um, we're planning to in implement support to import and export files of this format into uh, Windographer sometime this year. Great, thank you, Tom. That's great to hear from both of you. Looks like. We got a question from Nick Smith. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. Um, and it's just browsing through GitHub. It's exciting to see all the the different uh, schema and standards that you guys have put together. Has there been any attempt at uh, getting floating lidar um, standards? Because there's a few um, parameters that you want to include uh, from your MetaOcean campaigns that aren't in your standard uh, lidar campaign. Thanks, Nick. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because we just had our first meeting with um, on that exact topic. So um, we're we're on step one right now, and we're actually having a follow up meeting here pretty shortly. So if you're interested in, mm -hmm. in it, please um, 
was considered. And Stephen or Jason, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, we um, we had two floating LIDAR participants joined. Uh, others were invited. Uh, hopefully they'll come join the next one. Um, there was a lot of explaining the data model to them and they're interested. They see complications with it. Um, so we're having a second follow up meeting, which I think is about two weeks time uh, with them and hopefully some others uh, to kind of define what the scope of work would be. And um, with a floating LIDAR, there's a lot of parameters and a lot of other information that so what's needed for a wind resource assessment uh, specifically. Start with that as a smaller scope of work and then expand to capture all the other mid ocean analysis. I think we're, I think the data model as it stands captures probably nearly all of it already. Um, so we just need to talk to the people that know the data about floating LIDAR coming off the device themselves to, to verify that for us and have those discussions. So yeah, if you're interested, fire us an email, Slack message, and we'll, we'll send the invite to you. And anyone right. else who's interested. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just follow up and say throughout the entire development of the data standard, we've engaged what we hope to be a you know a broad stakeholder group, including equipment manufacturers, um, the the actual like calibration labs for the digital calibration certificates, etc. So, you know, I think we, especially if there's any floating line of manufacturers out there, um, we definitely welcome you into the process. Um, there's a couple of comments. Oh, I see a comment from Mark um, regarding CF conventions. I wasn't aware of it. I don't think most people in the committee were maybe only very partially aware of the conventions, but it was brought up, brought up in our past discussion on floating LIDAR. Um, you know, Mark, I, I'll say is that maybe we can have you join a meeting just so you can tell us a little bit more about it. Um, and it sounds like it would be helpful in creating the standard, but as far, you know, so far, I don't, I'm not sure how much of it is incorporated. And then, uh, Mark, do you have any comments to add to that before we move on? Okay, so I see a comment from Tom. Um, I was just going to say it, it yes. is very extensible and um, easy to, you know, there, there's some very, good naming conventions, standard naming conventions. It's used extensively with WOLF and other modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think it, it, it ties everything together quite nicely across measurement and models. Okay, thank you, Mark. We'll definitely use that uh, in any sort of future related work there. Um, I see a comment from Tom. Tom Clark, hello, Tom. Um, we're using JSON schema internally. Tom, you wanna go ahead and share your thoughts? Uh, well, that's it, really. Yeah. Um, the the biggest problem with interacting between any two companies is actually putting a flag in the ground and saying this is the data we've got, um, and and that's exactly what this does. So yeah, I couldn't be more impressed with you guys. This is really nice. Yeah. Uh, the someone asked a question about reflecting data out from SQL. Um, if you use SQL Alchemy, uh, you can reflect your SQL models into a into Python and then just JSONify that into yeah into a JSON serialized string. It's a good suggestion. Again, thank you, Tom. Clive, Peter, Clive, suggestion on touching base with IEC. Committee for floating lidar. That's good to know. <laughs> um, just a yeah. Just, just on that. we won't. We you know we won't be mandating uh, a data model per se. I don't expect, but it'd just be good to make sure we're kind of aligned so that we can point people in your direction effectively. I suppose. Sounds good, Peter. And it would also probably save us some. If you know, if you've just if the committee has discussed and standardized things, we don't need to reinvent it. So. That would be helpful. Um, Andrea does has. There's a hand up from uh, Christian Johnson. 
Yeah, hello. I just wanted to ask if you've had any uh, feedback or interaction with companies that install measurements or maintain measurements, because the dream would, of course, be if they could provide data in this format. Mm -hmm. Yes, ideally that would be the case. Uh, there are, well, Mike Purdue, NRG Systems is on the call and part of Task 43 and helped put this together. And so they're interested in implementing it. Um, mm -hmm. To MetMask installers, um, there's so many of them around the world. It, it's kind of difficult to, to kind of get get them involved as a, at a mass level. So I think the incentive is going to come down to um, the wind farm developers insisting that MetMass installers provide this data model schema along with their normal documentation. I think that's where it'll go. But if someone could come up with an awesome web tool that could help mass installers populate this data model, it would make their life easier and therefore it gets downstream and everyone's life will be a lot easier as well. Uh, sorry, Mike, you were going to say something. Uh, well, I, I think you you actually have covered it pretty well. And, and yes, NRG is not only you know planning to, but we are in the midst of implementing this now and bringing some of those tools to fruition through NRG Cloud. So uh, if you've not heard of NRG Cloud before, uh, please do have a look at our website and some of that support is coming. Um, for a variety of uh, of products, uh, our data loggers uh, for LIDARs as well. Uh, I might mention John Medley at ZX. Um, and uh, so there's conversations we can have. Great, so, thank you. I want to pause one second. I think Elizabeth Traeger had your hand up. I don't know if you're still on. Um, definitely want to take your question if you're still out there. Oh, I was just, I put it in the comment. Um, I work for DNV and this data format is badly expensive, I guess. And about the question about former analysts, we do have it on our import export. That is on. Excellent. So you're, you're cutting out there a little bit, but I think the gist of what you said is that it's on your list to actually support this data model for your kind of um, import export uh, processes with Correct. clients. Yeah, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. um, I see a question from or a comment from Andrea, Andrea on next step and whether uh, the equipment manufacturers may consider outputting data in this JSON format. Um, Michael from NRG, you heard his comment, and. Um, and yes, uh, we agree. Is the short of it. Um, and we'll hear. We'll wait to hear from the other manufacturers. Unless there's anyone here from Vaisala or WindSensor <laughs> who would like to chime in. Hi there. This is Andrew Black from Vaisala, and uh, uh, we 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 have as well uh, put JSON formatting onto our roadmap and are uh, discussing internally how to best contribute what what schemas are appropriate for um, completely capturing the metadata from LIDAR. And uh, it seems to me like really the benefits are we, we get the most out of this the farther upstream this is implemented. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, I see I see nodding in the videos, and I think this is the 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 ideal um, and, and, and the future. I think uh, from what we're hearing from the other manufacturers. One question I have for the group is: uh, Now we're in a transition period. It's like we see we see the future. The devices, the loggers, will output a JSON. Um, in uh, in the future, it's on the roadmaps of the manufacturers. It's uh, the, the 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 process flows for the resource assessment companies are now incorporating the data model. There is so much historical data though that doesn't have that 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 isn't formatted this way, and 
the, so my general question is sort of what is the balance between coding historical data um, way, uh, and sort of patience until the, 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 the perfect upstream tools exist? What's your advice for the industry in general um, on what to do with uh, what to do in the transition period? It's a great question, Andrew. Um, you know, Jason, let me ask you, I, I know we're getting to the end of this session, probably gone over it, and Andrew has a good question. Is that a question we can handle in the uh, the final section? Um, yeah, absolutely. I just respond to it quickly and say, you know, I'm even in this discussion, I'm kind of amazed at all the the activity that we're seeing around this. and. I think the general idea is that once you build it, there will be a, you know, a proliferation of services around it, right? Like, I meet his company is doing visualizations and data analytics and that kind of stuff. And there's probably a role for someone to help bridge this gap between historical data and the new, you know, the new paradigm. So, you know, I think the simple answer is connectors. Um, obviously, that becomes kind of a multifold problem because everybody has a slightly different you know, data spec that they're working to now. But, you know, I think there's a role for innovation there. Um, but yeah, let's let's move that forward. And Andrew, one, just to elaborate on Jason, um, Jason is, that's a good question. Like, for example, that's come up for me in the context of, hey, we have all these PDFs of old calibration data, you know, historical data, thousands of it. Uh, and because we now have a format that is a standard target, if that data were to be processed, it's given us enough like confidence that, oh, once we put it into this JSON, it's then really useful. And we've actually invested in like an up in an OCR machine learning kind of thing to invest to move you know those data into this format. So I think having a standard helps give confidence in where that you know I'll stop about that. Um so I I see Liz's. Liz, thank you for the announcement that DNB will be supporting it. Um, and Jose has a great idea that maybe OEMs can even have some of this JSON metadata in QR codes. That sounds great. Um, I think uh, Amit will, will. Yeah, and I think. This is there. pretty much the end of the questions I was just going to say. Um, yes, so thank you very much. And um, Jason, I'll pass it to you. And you know, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Super good. Um, so next 